And then, uh, like I said, a lot of dudes came. And you know, it's funny, during that time, I wasn't a minister in my dad's church. Uh, I was a kid, I was 19 years old, 20 years old. But my dad had a credential, a, a, a minister's credential. So as men were coming into my home, some of them, you know, had gotten locked up, parole violation. So I would go visit them in the county jail. And it was there that I met, that I met uh, Weddell Sherm. It was there that I met Weddell Sherm. I used to go in the county jail. Hopefully the statute of limitations is over now. But I used to use my dad's credential. Here's a little kid, right? A kid, 19 years old, going into the county jail with my dad's credential and say, hey, I'm a reverend. Uh, a pastor of a church in San Isidro because they didn't have his picture, just his name. And I'm a David Contreras Jr. And my mom, believe it or not, used to make me burritos. So I would even use my dad's briefcase and I would fill it up with burritos. And I would go to the county jail. And while I was in the county jail, word would get around to all the vatos in there doing time. And next thing you know, hey, you want a free burrito? You got to go talk to this preacher. You want a free burrito? He has to lay hands on you and you get two burritos, right? So next thing you know, I had vatos from everywhere coming down. Hey, we want to see this guy. We wanted to see this guy. But the visits that I would get were like attorney visits. I would have hand to hand with the guys. The guy would be in front of me, no, 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 no uh, wall between us. So I was able to lay hands and pray for these guys. And it was there where I met Weddell Sherm. I met a lot of guys there and God did do a lot of miracles in that county jail. So, so I'm there. So, and uh, so, so now uh, in 84, uh, I gave up the rehabilitation program and I got hired. I finally was able to, you know, get into uh, law enforcement. So I got hired with the Department of Corrections as a prison guard. This is in 84. The interaction with Weddell Sherm was very interesting. And the reason why, how I met Weddell Sherm was a guy by the name of Carlos Suniga. Carlos Suniga was a Chicano from a barrio in San Diego called Shelltown. And he had a brother named, named uh, Nick Suniga, Big Head Nick. And Carlos Suniga was a stone killer. Carlos Suniga loved to stab people. And, but he was from Shelltown, but he had long hair. He had a mustache and he had a little thing right here. And this vato was thick. He looked like a Samoan. He looked like you, Paul. But this vato was all muscle, right? And this vato, when he did a lot of time, every time he would go to prison, it was for stabbings. He was sticker, but he was a handsome, good-looking guy, very personable. So he got hooked up with the Hells Angels. He got hooked up with a bunch of outlaw motorcycle gangs. It was more of the Hells Angels. So when he got out, he got out with his long hair. He went to a bar and somebody did disrespected his girlfriend. So he goes up to him, he stabs the guy, he gets caught. Now they give him, I think they gave him 13 to 20 back then because it was indeterminate sentencing back then. Determinate, indeterminate sentencing. So he was the one that introduced me because he was from Shelltown to Weddle Sherm. He goes, there's a youngster in here. His name is Weddle Sherm, and uh, this vato, uh, he, uh, he's one of the founders of a gang called uh, Gamma Street, and he's up and coming. He goes, he's a little killer, he goes, but uh, he, he wants your mom's burritos. I go, well, the only way that vato's going to get my burritos, he's got to come down and hear the word of God. And when Wedo, when I first met Weddle, I was 22, 20, 22, 21. And so Weddle was about a year younger, I think. He was like 20. And he had, he had, uh, he was there for the murder that he was convicted for. And uh, I met with Weddle for about nine months during his trial. And at the very end, uh, uh, I laid hands on him and, and God touched his high, his, his life, God touched his heart. And we had a lot of conversations. Uh, I was there when he was sentenced. I actually, because I was, you know, a deacon by now, I'm a deacon in my dad's church. Um, by now, uh, I was there during his whole trial. And after he was convicted, I remember uh, I went back to the county jail and for two weeks, he didn't want to see me. For two weeks, he didn't want to see me. Because uh, he was angry. He was angry, I think, probably with God, because I mean, I never told him you're going to get out. God's going to do a miracle. We prayed for a miracle. But you know, uh, God put him in his place, you know, whatever he did, there's consequences to our actions, right? So and the funny thing about it is for he was going to get the bus like a week later on a Wednesday, that's when the bus would pick come. And the funny thing about Weddle prior to that, we would talk about God, he would, he was a clown, he was always laughing, hey, David, you know, making jokes. But when it came time to be serious about God, he would listen, you know what I mean? And, and God would touch his heart. I mean, I remember seeing God touch his heart. And then, you know, he'd pretend like nothing happened and walk back upstairs, reaching, going. But when he was there, 
He was Wero, you know what I mean? He was who he was, Raul Leon, not Wero. So um, that one week before he left to St. Quentin, he comes down from the tier. And uh, because, I mean, I got there and I go, hey, so every time I would go, I would put his name down and he would reject it. So that time he came down, but this was a different Wero. When he came down, it wasn't the same Wero because he was high control. So they had him, you know, shackled legs, waist and arms. So he would come in, you know, high power, right? I think it was a yellow band back then. He'd come in high power. And this time he sat down and he looked at me and it wasn't the same Wero. Two weeks, two weeks, he changed his facial expression, uh, the way he looked at me, the way he talked at me, talked toward me. He sat down and he goes, que paso, David? I go, what do you mean, que paso, David? Before it was, hey, brother David, I go, what? I go, hey, man, I go, I'm really sorry what happened, but you know what? God could use you in the county. I mean, God could use you in St. Because he goes, I'm going to St. Quentin. I go, what there? God could use you, man. You know what, God, you could be a testimony for his power. And I remember he looked at me and he goes, nah. He goes like that. He goes, nah, chale. He goes, I'm going to be the leader of the MS someday. And I go, okay, you are? He goes, yeah. He goes, and you know what, Ese? You're going to hear, I'm going to run the MS someday. Just like that, from being uh, two weeks before, pray for me, God's going to, I hope God does a miracle, to all of a sudden, just completely changed. And as he's talking to me, I'm not going to get into the conversation, but he told me everything, how the murder occurred. And I didn't want to hear it, but he starts telling me and he starts breaking it down. And then I did this and then I did that. And I looked at him and I go, what, why are you telling me that? I go, he goes, I just want you to know, I say that, you know what, that I am who I am and I'm going to run the MS someday. I go, but I don't care about your trial. I go, he goes, but I just want you to know that that's who I am. And I, I remember I looked at him. And I just go, you know, pray, well, I pray that God have mercy on you and that I know you gave your life to him. And I pray that God someday gives you the opportunity to go back to him. And he just laughed, you know, laughed. And, and we left it at that. And then he left. So Carlos Zuniga, like I said, ended up, the dude that introduced me to him, ended up getting 30, I mean, 13 to 20. I think that's what it was. So now, Guero leaves. Now, two years later, I'm, I'm working for, I get hired with the California Department of Corrections. I leave New Life. Uh, I, matter of fact, the director, Danny Otto, the guy I told you about, you, I had sent you his picture. He ended up becoming the director of New Life. I had Rogelio and then Danny Otto became the director. And that program, believe it or not, from 1978, is still today in San Isidro. It's still a, it, a rehabilitation program like Victory Outreach. It's still very powerful. Out of the New Life, ministers have come out. Um, missionaries have come out that have gone to Honduras, El Salvador, preaching the gospel of Christ. And pastors have come out. A lot of pastors have come out of that ministry, New Life, right? So now I get, I get hired with the California Department of Corrections. And uh, one of the, uh, it's called OJT, while you're going through the academy, on the job training, they take you to different pintas. And one of the pintas they took us to was to Tracy State Prison. And I remember uh, walking into Tracy and I'm walking there with a group of correctional officers. And as we're walking, one of the things that they teach you, Joe, at the Corrections Academy is don't tell anybody who you are, where you're from, especially where you're from, or don't tell them anything personal because these, because they, they, they basically tell you these inmates are gonna basically try to use you to bring in dope, uh, weapons uh, and you know cigarettes or whatever, and they're going to use you to bring in contraband. So don't tell them anything because they'll use that against you. So during the, I think it was three to six weeks back then in '84. I don't remember how long the academy was. It's been so long. So I think it was six weeks. We were brainwashed literally to say, man, when we got into the pinta, they, uh, I, I'm not going to know anybody in there. I thought I wasn't going to know anybody in there. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to tell them anything about me, man, because they might start using, you know, maybe try to, you know, do something to my father, knowing he's a pastor, get me to do something. Nothing that, like that ever happened. But I just thought, right? So I'm walking into the pinta. There's about 25, 30 correct, new kids, new correctional officers. We're walking in. There's a sergeant leading us and a bunch of other correctional officers around us. So we're all new, new, new fish, right? Walking into the joint. Tracy, I mean, Tracy was the gladiator school back then, you know, in the 80s. It was gladiator school. So, but believe it or not, the way, going back to the Weddell Sherm, I know I'm talking a lot, but I mean, hopefully your audience finds it informative, informative. Um, 
it was there at, at uh, the county. It was there at uh, CMC that uh, the warden, his name was Estelle, was his last name. I mean, I'm talking back in 85 now, right? 84, 85. And he calls me into the office. Now I'm working. I have my own theater. I have my own tier and I have my own building. And he calls me to the office once. All of a sudden, the security squad shows up to my building. And the security squad, they're called the goon squad. They're correctional officers, but they were, they're the ones that wear the jumpsuits. They're the ones that hit all the houses, all the cells and so forth. They show up, and instead of coming to get an inmate, they're coming to get me, a correctional officer, right? They come up. I was on the third tier. They come up, running upstairs, and everybody's going, the goon squad, goons. All the inmates are throwing themselves on the walls or on the floor. And I'm like, hey, guys, what do you guys need? He goes, you're going with me. The sergeant says, I think it was Sergeant Lopez. He goes, you're going with me. And I looked at him, and I go, where am I going? And he goes, the warden wants to talk to you. And here's a brand new correction. I had just started. I was only there for about a couple of months. So I looked at the I looked at him and he goes, the warden wants to talk to you. And I go, okay. So as they're walking me out, all the inmates, they're all yelling, ooh, orale, it's about those dirty. You know, they're all thinking, you know, that I'm getting arrested by the goon squad, right? So I'm walking with them and they put a, a circle around me, no handcuffs, nothing at all, but they're walking me over there. And as we're walking into the warden's office, the sergeant stayed and he sits me down. So now I'm, I'm sweating like, 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 I mean, I'm sweating bullets thinking, what the heck did I do? Did an inmate say that I brought dope in? I mean, I'm, th I'm thinking the worst, right? And I'm thinking, man, what did I do? So the warden looks at me and he goes, Mr. Contreras, he goes, Mr. Contreras, David Contreras? I go, yes. And he goes, what is this? And I remember he threw a letter uh, on my lap, throws a letter on my lap. And the letter said, uh, Reverend David Contreras, New Life Apostolic Outreach, 3747 Sunset Lane. And up on top, it said, Wero Sherm. Well, it said Raul Leon. He was at, um, I think he was at St. Quinn at the time, or he was at Pelican Bay at the time. And he goes, what is this? And I go, what's the letter? He goes, right, was it addressed to you? I go, yes, sir. And he goes, you're in contact with Wedo Sherm. Wedo, by now, Wedo Sherm had already made his bones. He already had stabbed a correctional officer. He was already an MM member, and he was going up the ranks. 